things, it is I, the Dalek Emperor, and welcome back to another Dalek cast today. We have a lot of questions here today. Let's begin answering them. Apparently, 
And apparently the first of the reactions are Big Dad Wolf. I've no idea what this is about, but but from what I can tell, it's something about the Big Bad Wolf, apparently. And this, uh, from the Little Pig stories, and this was made by Sir Young. I don't know why Jeremy Alberding suggested this, but hopefully um, I can expect things from this. Let's observe. Big Dad Wolf, okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you for make uh, thank you for suggesting a studio wedding. I uh, I was a bit confused, but anyway, um um let's um let's move on then. Now it's time to have a look at something that's a bit more on the dark side. Now this was made by Brick Animations and is a scene recreation of the um, of the episode, uh, a scene recreation from the Star Wars episode, which, if you must know, I have played in a Lego Scar uh, Lego Star Wars: The Skywalker Saga. The Last Jedi. Now, boy, before you ask, yes, I know. I, I, I know the episode is terrible, um, which personally I, I agree with. Um, as poor writing and just wasn't the best film. But let's see how it is recreated in Lego. And this is a scene where Ray and Ben Solo battle the Praetorian Guards. And oh, it's starting off with the best... Uh, with um, some of the best lines from the movie. I guess turning the lightsaber to strike true. And now, the foolish child, he ignites it. And kills his true enemy. And that snow is destroyed. Let's see how this turns out in Lego form. Damn. Look at her go. Look at them go. If you must know, Kylo Ren is my favorite, one of my favorite characters in Star Wars. But I have to say, Darth Vader is better, though. That's right. to put your channel link in the 
description below for animations. Okay, so this video was made by Slick Eddie, and... And, um, apparently it's called Helmo EAS Product EAS Scenario in Real Life. What's it? Yeah, I hope it's not, you know... Betty, um, I hope this video isn't, you know, um, you know, I hope this video isn't too cringy, What's it? but let's see what it is. What's up, YouTube? It's what your boy Slick, Slick Eddie here, and I am in a tight situation. But yeah, apparently he wants me to react to part two, apparently. Okay. Helmo! Uh, oh, uh, God. Anyway, Helmo is back. What the freak is Helmo? We will add that out. Helmo has returned. What the freak is Helmo? Okay, I'm in a tight space. Uh -oh. I don't know where they're at. It could be anywhere. Run. Run. So this is seven minutes long, I so. yeah. <laughs> Take that, that Elmo. What the freak is that? Um, like like my thing. thing. What the fuck? Man, you go get him. Fuck. Get out of me. Maybe you should get out of me. How long is this city again? Let go of my leg. Wow, you just throwing that gold sword at me? I suck at knife throwing. Okay. I broke a diamond sword. I broke a diamond sword with my own bare hands. Come on, that. Well, it it seems uh, <laughs> it seems. Uh, it, Wait, what? Ow, my balls! Right. How long is this city again? Ew. Right. Um. You suck. Why did you say that? You know what? Hey, don't make me go gorilla. Right, okay. Um, let me just. I'm gonna fast forward. Um, Oh, my God. 
Okay. Big ball time, bitch. Okay, um, yeah, uh, I'll probably look at this video more in depth off camera, but, yeah, um, yeah, this video was so alright, yeah, as I said, still a bit cringe in my opinion, but it was good. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so this video in question is called Freezer vs. Kill Dragon from Kill it from Dragon Ball Xenoverse, apparently. Uh, what's this about then? Let's have a look. Hello, Hello everyone. Uh, I am Freezer, the Galactic Emperor of the Universe. Now, hold on. Who said you're the Galactic Emperor of the Universe, Freezer? I thought we agreed that I would do the Galactic Emperor of the Universe. I think you'll find out that I'm the Galactic Emperor of the Universe. We did, we did not, not agree on that one, cool that shut up, slap up. How about you shut up, slap up? Screw you. you. No, no, you. No, I can never get tired of you, cool that. Since you are that. Now then, stay should we do? I don't know. No, 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 no. I destroyed the place, if you remember. Planet Namek makes his three games. When Earth is there, I destroyed it. And they destroyed it. Look, it's in flames. This is lava you don't whatever. Look at the city, it's in ruins. Oh, look, hell. Even I didn't send to hell. Um. No, uh, not been overly critical, though. The uh, not being overly critical, Omega, but um, I don't know why you're not using a screen recording for this video because when I when I record the videos, I have like a video recording software that I use sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I don't know where you're recording this from, but if you really, if you wanted to, like, record the game, um, I do have a more better option to do that. Um, Microsoft Store, 
uh, let's just say, um, the, uh, well, let's just say, it's, it's good, it's good, but I think what needs to be improved upon is, is how, how you record it, and, uh, and you can also, um, yeah, also, uh, just so you know, when, when you're recording, just, just I don't know, be, 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 um, be, be yourself, like, um, put, put some, put some emotion, uh, Actually, um, and again, you already uh, are doing quite well with recording, but yeah, get some decent, uh, get some decent screen recording software because because uh, you'll be able to get you'll be able to get more more subscribers that way if you um, have like a. Um, if you um, have, have like a high quality videos basically anyway uh, let us move swiftly on to these videos uh, made by resurrected starships apparently um, first one is about a dreadnought so I'll be right back Okay, so here is a four minute long video called The Dreadnought, the heavy crease of action be canon. And this is a, from the Randilly Star Drive Dreadnought. Oh, oh, this is from Star Wars. I had no idea. This is this is from Star Drive. Uh, Star Wars. Longest running capital ships in the Star Wars galaxy. No way. They're a step down from Star Destroyers or Mon Calamari cruisers, but a step up from Nebulon B frigates or both. Dreadnoughts hold a special place. So this is a rebellion. Older Star Wars fans, as they made their first appearance in the Throne Trilogy novels by attending the Throne Trilogy. They're also special to me, because when I tell a Star Wars story, I would prefer these cruisers as a hero ship rather than something like a Star Destroyer transport freighter like the Evan Hawk Millennium Falcon. No way. Long before the Clone Wars, most are They've been around since the Clone Wars. And heavily modified. They required an enormous crew complement. But this is later. Right, I'm putting a, a, putting a like on this video. Putting a like. Known as the Katana Fleet. The Katana Fleet. And the Thrawn Trilogy novels. Uh, service. Dreadnoughts have been used by virtually every faction in Star Wars. Uh, Separatists, the Empire, the Rebel Alliance, the New Republic, and various scums and villains, such as pirates, for about a century. Now, I don't know if the First Order used them. This particular dreadnought is a pirate dreadnought called the Saber. And since I put a lot of time and detail into finally finishing this model, I'll but, use it but I do know that the First Order order did use a dreadnought that they made themselves. Uh, I can't remember, it was in Last Jedi, but maybe. I can't remember what it was called. But there was a even larger ship um, that the First Order made uh, for Supreme Leader Snoke. I was called the Supremacy. Some of the upcoming fan fiction videos. Although the I was possibly made on Exegol. The classic dreadnought design features. 
gorgeous. She is about 600 meters in length, putting her at twice the size of a Nebulon V frigate and about a third the size of an Imperial Star Destroyer. A third of a size! She has several weapon blisters on the hull. The, the, uh, yeah, the Imperial Star Destroyer is a dwarf to buy. In this case, the Sabre no, no, it's the thing that is dwarfed by the Imperial Star Destroyer. I wonder if there is... Well, maybe not the First Order, but the Resistance could have used them. Alright. Several. Yeah, lasers would be the best option. Wait, oh, wait, are those, oh, shield generators? Mm, yeah, because if, like, any TIE fighters or Imperial Star Destroyers attack those, the shield generators kaput. That means the ship will be able to be enterable and either destroyed by a Star Destroyer or, i.e., the Death Star. has given up some hull space in favor of a hangar required to carry a wide variety of fighters. Ready. Pirates have to use what's available. Now I'll touch oh, the pirates. There are a lot of pirates in Star Wars, such as um, the Guavian Death Gang, um, Cat Bane's crew, uh, most of Jabba's um, bounty hunters. In the case of the Saber, the ion cannons are useful for disabling other ships, so the pirate oh, can be used as well. Since many targets are too fast for the Saber to catch, they're complemented with Z95s armed with ion cannons and uh, pursue a disabled victim. You probably wonder what my favorite Star Wars ship is. It is the Imperial Star Destroyer. Actually, no, not the Imperial Star Destroyer. The Imperial Star Destroyer Executive Class. Mm. No way. This is good. So, we have this video now, which was called Balance of Terror. And it's about 18 minutes long, so let's begin then. The most interesting and important battles in Star Trek history is the one portrayed in the old series episode, Balance of Terror. Balance of, Balance of Terror was like the third Star Trek I've ever seen, and the very first to really portray a battle in Star Trek. Really? This episode is very important as an episode, but also for the lore of Star Trek. It tells the story yeah. of a battle. Just wondering, Alberting, could you send me more, uh, like, Star Wars related things as well? Because I do like, I do like to watch Star Trek things, but yeah, Star Wars is also, um, well, it, it's, I'm more into Star Wars than Star Trek. It had to be fought and won in order to prevent a war. It's not, Romulans no, I don't want you to send Star Trek things, I do, it's just... In -universe, in -universe, and tactics I'm the not that much of a fan of Star Trek. First about this episode, Romulan Warbird. I have to first tell you, this episode is heavily inspired by the old classic 1950s naval movie, The Enemy Below which is about a battle between an American destroyer and a German U-boat. It's an excellent movie which goes in depth about naval tactics, the thinking and strategy and the, below. And the will and guts of both sides. Ooh, I want to watch I that. I watching it if you have a free evening after Yeah, yeah, I'll now, definitely, definitely have a look at it. to have copies in the Star Trek episode. However, after rewatching both side by side, I can't dismiss the innovative manner in which the writer well, this is movie made, um, tell me when Enemy Below was made and then I'll probably have a look at it, um, in my own time. 
seen in this episode. Before okay. getting into the battle, let's look at both of the contenders. Now, neither side had contact for a hundred years. The last contact was the ending of a bloody war between Earth and her allies and the Romulan Star Empire. The Romulan Star Empire, really? The treaty that ended the war established a neutral zone. Any incursion by either side into the neutral zone was an act of war. Each side maintains a number of outposts along the borders of the zone to keep an eye on the other side. Now, in the last 100 years, Earth and her allies have united and formed the United Federation of Planets. And this is largely the result of the Romulan War, which, although devastating, in the end served to create a powerful interstellar entity, a power that expands rapidly and often comes in odds with Martian civilizations such as the Klingons. Based on what we know from the last season and the best season of Star Trek Enterprise, the Romulans pulled strings behind the scenes to weaken Earth and others, certainly a prelude to Romulan military aggression. Clearly the Romulans know a great deal more about Earth and her allies than Earth knows about the Romulans. Spock declares in this episode that the Federation still doesn't know what the Romulans look like. While the Federation continued to grow after the war, it is not known what the Romulans were up to. But based on the Romulan commander's reference to all the battles and campaigns he fought with his comrades, and bringing another war to the Empire, I'm sure it's safe to say that the Romulans have been busy. More than likely, while the Federation has been expanding through diplomacy, the Romulans have been doing the same through conquest. By the time of this episode, the Romulans are confident and brazen, which tells us they've been rather successful in their various military campaigns, and finally feel ready to risk testing their old adversaries, the and the Federation. But the Romulans, although aggressive, aren't stupid. They decide to send one ship, one ship only. So why, why only send one ship? If, if, if I was in, if the Daleks were in this situation, they would just send like multiple, we would just like send multiple ships to attack them individually. Um, but I don't get why the Romulans have like a strategic ability where they can like only use like one warship or bird. Well, the Romulans are not willing to commit to a full-scale war without first testing Starfleet's resolve and tactical abilities. If this one ship was successful in its mission by defeating Starfleet's defenses, or seeing that they're afraid of Romulan weapons, then they can prepare for another war with the Federation. If this one ship loses the battle, the Empire can then claim the Romulan commander was not acting under orders and is renegade or rogue. They know the Federation would rather not go to war over just this one incursion, and the Romulans will have learned a great deal about the Federation's military capabilities, no matter the outcome. Phew, so that's a lot of setup for the contenders, so let's go into what happens. The Enterprise is on its way to the neutral zone, because the outposts watching it are going dark one by one, for mysterious reasons. Finally, Outpost 4 manages to get a distress call out. I find it interesting that Outpost 4 was the only outpost that managed to get the call out, indicating that some sort of jamming may have taken place. The Romulans seem to have deliberately allowed Outpost 4 to get its call out, perhaps to see what Starfleet's response will be. Even though the Enterprise is at maximum warp, just before reaching phaser range, the Romulans decloak and finish off Outpost 4 to everyone's shock with a powerful plasma weapon and then recloak. Ah, uh, no, an advertisement. Nope. Ah, this is your advertisement. There we go. Again, this is all testing. The Romulans now know the maximum speed of the Enterprise. I must note that all this time, both Kirk and Spock are genuinely caught off guard by the cloaking device, as if they've never seen this kind of technology before. Although motion sensors do track something out there, perhaps a distortion, which they call a blip, the Enterprise cannot get an exact... So he's saying that they can travel all the way through all the known systems, but they can't even detect a single neutral zone or Romulan um, incursion. Fix on the wrong 
Romulan ship while it's afloat, and then the Romulan ship Why? usually turns back in the direction of the neutral zone. What? Again, very obvious, as if letting everyone know, yes, we are Romulans, we are here, come play with us. Now, Kirk believes that the cloaking device may work both ways, preventing the Romulans from seeing them as well, leaving only I mean, special officers capable of work, the enterprise while I guess. And he may not be wrong in that. After all, if the photons are bending around the Romulan ship to create a true cloaking device, the cloak would work both ways. So Kirk decides to order a parallel course matching the exact speed and course of the Romulan in an attempt to look like an echo or a sensor ghost. This is actually a direct allusion from the movie The Enemy Below, where the American destroyer captain does the same thing when tracking the German U-boat. Uh, nice. mistake. Subspace radio silence is broken, and they send a visual message back to Romulus reporting of their glorious mission. Uhura and Spock are able to intercept this message, and finally, after a century, the appearance of the Romulans is revealed, and they are Vulcanoid. Apparently, at some point in the past, a Vulcan splinter colony formed the Romulan Star Empire. This erases uh, Romulan's great advantages. After all, so fight an unknown. Ah, so the Romulans are Vulcan. Are rogue Vulcans, um. then. Right. The Romulans then decloak and make some maneuvers. We're not clear why, but there is some talk of saving power. But the Romulan commander is not fooled by the reflection that follows them. Why would he be? Kirk has underestimated the Romulans, who are still just toying with them at this point. The Romulans just be close, and occasionally turns to see if there's any change to the sensor echo. After the shock of the discovery about the Romulans' origins wears off, both sides are considering all the information they've gathered, and the Enterprise is finally able to make a tactical assessment. Let's line these ships up side by side. The Constitution class. Armed with phasers, which are accurate and energy efficient, and photon torpedoes, which are not actually used in this episode, but will be a few episodes later. I believe the torpedoes may have been too imprecise to track a cloaked ship. The Constitution class has an extremely powerful matter-antimatter warp drive, shields and deflectors. The Romulan Warbird, on the other hand, is designed around their primary weapon, the Plasma Torpedo Launcher. Right. This extremely powerful weapon can reduce the hardest substance known to man to a brittle crust that crumbles under Spock's fingers. The plasma envelops the target and then forces an implosion. The Warbird has a practical invisibility screen, making it very difficult to hit, but still possible with accurate sensor readings. Okay. The power source is unknown. Scotty implies that it's simple impulse. I believe he means to say that at least while cloaked, the Romulan ship is only capable of running on impulse power, and that the power supply is finite, a fuel that can be depleted. Of course, there can be no doubt that it has some sort of faster than light travel, or it would have taken it decades or even centuries to even reach the neutral zone. I believe this is further set up for a submarine-like battle. The Enterprise's warp drive is analogous to the diesel engine of a World War II destroyer, a powerful and fast propulsion system, while the Romulan Warbird's power, when cloaked, is similar to a U-boat's battery power when submerged, limited by charge, and much slower than a diesel engine. Right. And of course, the Romulans must be cloaked to fire their weapons. So we have two very different ships with very different tactical abilities, and this is an excellent matchup in my opinion. After some discussion and assertions by Spock and Lieutenant Stiles that the Romulans are likely to start a war with the Federation if weakness is shown, Kirk decides to fight this battle to prevent a larger conflict. I totally agree with his decision. Sometimes battles or even wars must be fought to prevent larger conflicts. The next squad element is fantastic and perhaps one of the more innovative parts of this battle. The Warbird is changing course for a comet. Kirk sees a chance to attack, knowing the Warbird will leave a visible trail 
when it goes through the comet's tail, giving the Enterprise a target to shoot at. But it's not what Kirk thinks it is. Kirk, in this instance, is overly anxious to catch the Romulan before it escapes back into the neutral zone, and didn't stop to think why the Romulan would head for the comet in the first place. The Romulan intends to use the comet as cover to conceal a U-turn back onto the Enterprise, where he will suddenly attack. But the Romulan also misjudges Kirk, who capitalizes on speed and swings around to the other side of the comet, where he intends to attack when the Romulan comes through the tail. The Romulan commander suddenly realizes Kirk's intent, orders evasive at the last second, but the Enterprise also loses its opportunity to fire at any trail the Romulans have left. Not all is lost for the Enterprise, however. The Enterprise aims with sensors and attacks anyway with phasers. Now I want to say something about the nature of phasers here. Styles clearly states that the phasers are set to proximity blast. This is pretty much the first time we see their use in space combat. In this special mode, rather than beams, they fire bursts, and on the receiving end, they act a little bit like depth charges. Okay. In years, we've seen in Star Trek all manner of phasers. Some are beams, some are pulses, some are like bolts, and sometimes the same phaser system will fire in two different ways. Phasers, although probably over-engineered, are very sophisticated and versatile weapons. In this case, an expanding phaser burst towards an invisible target would have more chance of hitting or doing some kind of damage. Of course, such a burst would dissipate a bit quicker, limit its range, and would be less potent overall. But this is the appropriate mode needed for hitting a cloaked Romulan ship that isn't easy to lock onto. Anyway, the Enterprise is able to rough up the Romulan warbird enough to cause the Romulan some distress with this less than optimal attack. And then, disaster strikes. As I said, perhaps phasers are a bit over-engineered and aren't intended to operate in this manner. The phasers overload and a okay. burns out. The timing couldn't be worse. The Romulans decloak and fire on the Enterprise. Just in the nick of time, Kirk orders full astern and to engage emergency warp. The plasma ball follows the Enterprise and begins to overtake her. Now normally I wouldn't think that a plasma ball would be able to make warp speed, but apparently this one can. Either this weapon is working as intended, or it is possible, either by design or by accident, that this plasma torpedo was caught up in the Enterprise's warp field and drug along at warp speed. Luckily, plasma torpedoes lose their potency over time, and by the time the plasma hits, there is minimal damage to the Enterprise. At this point, the weaknesses of the Rockland Warbird are becoming quite apparent. The Enterprise closes easily again and continues to fire phasers on proximity blasts. If there is any sign of the Romulan decloaking, the Enterprise can simply outrun any torpedo attack and or use a phaser blast to attack the torpedo itself. Okay. While the ship has a power, power, it cannot continue to maintain its cloak, but Kirk pursues the Romulan into the neutral zone and continues to attack. The Romulan commander has lost the tactical advantage, and the constant phaser barrage is getting under the Romulan skin. They must now resort to trickery to get the phasers off of them, and eject a debris field, enough to distract the Enterprise's sensors. They then stop moving. While Spock does realize that this is a trick, he's also lost all sensor contact with the Romulan ship. The Enterprise has lost the Romulans. A waiting game then ensues for hours. Both sides know the other is still out there. Spock, while working on the phasers, accidentally powers up a sensor on his console and gives away their position. The waiting game is up. The Romulans have regained the advantage and moved towards the Enterprise, still undetected. Kirk is brilliant in this instant and turns their blunder into an advantage. Having already predicted that the Romulans are already moving towards them, he simply reverses course and fires at the Enterprise's previous position to score some hits on the Romulans. But the Romulans have one final trick up their sleeve. They eject more debris, and within the debris field, they sneak in a nuclear mine. 
The Enterprise oh, is at the last minute, but not before the blast from the weapon hits the Enterprise with loads of gamma radiation, like you'd see from a nuclear blast. This shocks the Enterprise, rendering it helpless for some moments. But this is where the Romulan commander makes his most fatal mistake. He doesn't take the opportunity to finish off the Enterprise. I must comment here that I really prefer the Romulans as opponents to the Klingons. With the Klingons, you mostly know what you're gonna get. The Romulans are far more complex and intellectually intriguing. This Romulan commander is very war-weary, unlike his subordinates. Although I see. And experience, whatever the conflicts the Romulans have recently been involved in, this Romulan has clearly endured some personal losses. It's hard to not like this Romulan, and actually feel something for his plight. As an audience, we want him to have a fighting chance. But after the Enterprise recovers, the same old game continues. The Romulan subordinates Theseus, to his credit, goads his commander into doing the Romulan thing to fulfill his duty and attack again. And here again, we see the flaw of over engineering. Too many things can go wrong. With Klingon disruptors, they're crude, but you know they're gonna work every time. With Romulan plasma, same deal. It has its limitations, but you don't have to worry about silly things like circuit burnouts and coolant leaks. The phaser control room has been contaminated with a coolant leak, rendering the Enterprise defenseless when Romulans zero in on their prey. Had it not been for Spock's heroics, okay. if the phasers charged up in spite of the leak, the Enterprise would have been destroyed. Now here's a small spoiler about the movie, The Enemy Below. That movie ends with both commanders saving each other's lives from the burning hulks of their respective vessels. In this case, the Romulan commander knows he will be dishonored if he allows himself to live or his vessel to be captured. He acknowledges Kirk's offer for aid, declaring that they could have been friends in another life. With no countdown at all, he triggers the warbird to immediately self-destruct. A glorious and honorable death for a true Romulan. Yes. This tells me that in many ways the Romulans have an honor and duty code that rivals the Klingons in spite of their reputation for treachery. But in this battle, the Enterprise was at risk of being destroyed on at least three occasions. It could have easily gone the other way. I love how this episode occasionally drops what appears to be unpredictable random plot elements, for better or for worse, like the phaser burnout. Yes, I see. The commander's war Very well. All of these are unpredictable elements that take place in real combat. No matter how much Sun Tzu one reads... I respect that Romulan from... F for sacrificing himself. What the tacticians are. Battles and war is a very messy and unpredictable business. Amazingly, the Enterprise. Also, I think I nearly fell asleep. Sorry about this. Came away with only a single mm. casualty, and at times the entire ship is in danger of being. Sorry about that. I nearly fell the asleep. Did not start a war that. But yeah, this is a good video. I like it. Thank you, Albany. Technology further into a brief alliance with the Klingons. In short, this battle, having prevented a war and spurring the Romulan Klingon alliance briefly, would have an impact on the quadrant that would last for decades. Okay. Thank you for watching Space Friends. Be sure to like. Ah, uh, you're welcome. Yes. Anyway, uh, it is time to react to one last video. This is this video was made by Swedish dictator, and it's called the Cult of. Garo has problems. Okay, so this was suggested by uh, Dalek Sec. So, without further ado, let us observe. Apparently, this is made in 2009, and apparently, the cult of Scaro has problems with Martha Jones. And apparently, it's a parody of them. Oh, family guy, let's have a look. She is messed up, man! Shut up! Just shut up! Let me think! Push oh, her out! Yes, we can't I'm leave her alone! This. Push the bitch out! Uh, 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 wait, no, I've already seen this one. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that was a ref. Oh, I've seen that cutaway gag before. That was very good. Thank you, Swedish dictator. Credit will go to you for making this video. Anyway, uh, it is time to end.
let us sink it back to me then. Okay, my fellow subjects, I've enjoyed this video today. Thank you for the suggestion. See you all in the next video then. Goodbye.